Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Wartstone's Instagram Live. Um, my name is Andrew McMillan. I'm a poet and writer. Um, I teach at the Manchester Writing School here in Manchester, um, at Manchester Metropolitan University. And I'm thrilled tonight to be hosting this special Wattstones Instagram live event where we're going to be joined by Okichuku Nzelu to talk about the paperback publication of his debut novel, The Private Joys of Nena Maloney. And um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to invite O'Kane in a second. We're going to have a chat. Um, we're going to hear some, some from uh, this magnificent, beautiful book. Um, and then there'll be a chance as well, hopefully, to ask Okachuku some questions um, as we get towards the end of the event. And so I'm just going to bring um, OK into the event, um, if I can find them. Hopefully they're here. Hope everyone's having a good evening. If there are any strange noises that you hear, it's my dog that's sleeping at my feet. It's not me. I always like to say that just as a... Disclaimer. Um, okay, into the group now. Oh, I'm the wrong way around. Hello. Um, everyone, Chris, Chris around. <laughs> Plays on the side. Oh, no, there we go. That added a much drama to the introduction that I was <laughs> Fantastic. How are you? I'm good. I'd just like to make an entrance, you know, even if it's... 90, that's I mean, a 90 degree angle. Side, you know, it's fabulous. A little flip around. <laughs> so, welcome. We're the the, the um, paperback publication of The Prime Joys of Nena Maloney, who was shortlisted for the Desmond Elliott for the Polari First Book Prize. It was a winner of the Betty Trask Award. It was reviewed everywhere that one might want something to be reviewed. It was kind of praised by people. <laughs> Atlas Williams, Bernadine Evaristo. It's been an astonishing year since the hardback came out. And I'm really excited to chat to you about that and, and for people to hear more about that. But I wonder, first of all, if for people who might not have heard the book or read the book yet, if you just want to give us a bit of a taster um, and maybe just read us a few pages. Yeah. Thank you. Um, let me see. Where are we? Here we are. So, um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this Waterstones uh, Instagram Live. And thank you to Waterstones for allowing Andrew and I to take over for the evening. Um, and yeah, I'm really thrilled and excited about the fact that my novel is now available in paperback. It's such a wonderful occasion. Like, it, it marks a year into the book's life. And it also marks another stage in the book's life. Um, and sort of speaking of moving on to new things, I'm going to read to you from a uh, part of the novel where um, one of my characters is sort of a bit of a crossroads. Um, Nena is, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the novel, um, Nena is a teenager. She's about six, she's 16 years old. She's about to turn 17. And she is thinking about what to do next. And she's just been, she's just been told by her teacher um, that she could if she wanted to, she could go and study in Paris uh, at university. And she loves French and she's a prodigy at the language. Um, but she's not quite sure if this is right for her. So I'm just going to read to you from this section. Paris. Her imaginings of it were vague. She had only been once before, her mother's salary being an, unable to extend to holidays each year, but passionate. It did not even occur to her to imagine that she wouldn't love every moment. Paris. Her mind saw a kaleidoscope of images of herself, riding around the city on a bicycle, sporting a beret, flirting in advanced French with attractive young French men, flirting in advanced French with attractive young French men while wearing a beret, leisurely attending a couple of morning lectures before meeting her sophisticated friends for red wine at midday. It would be perfect. In her mind, going to university in Paris would whisk away everything in her life that was mundane or awkward or incomplete and turn it into something sleek and extraordinary. If, if she decided to come back to England after graduation, she could explain to new friends at sleek and extraordinary dinner parties that she had studied at the Sorbonne and that this was where she had learned the secret of how to stay enviably thin while dining exclusively on pastries and cheese. And that this was where she'd met her husband, Alphonse, Edouard, Philippe. She could decide the details later. Alexandre, Antoine, Jean-Baptiste, Danny. 
she had only realized now that absolutely nowhere in her imagination was her boyfriend of one year. Until her mother brought him up, she hadn't even thought about him. She felt a pang of guilt and tried to imagine him in Paris with her, but her life with Danny flashed before her eyes and she didn't like it. Dashing Parisian men shrugged disappointedly because Danny was the boyfriend they'd always hoped that she would not have. And they walked resignedly away. Danny wouldn't drink red wine with her because it was too feminine and holding those delicate glasses made him feel vulnerable. So he'd neck, so he'd neck lager instead and make fun of the names on the bottles she'd collect on her windowsills. He would never be able to go to lectures with her because he wasn't sure that he wanted to go to university at all. He resented the assumption that he would, wanted to be a footballer. Could he try out for French teams? Of course, but he wouldn't want to live in France with her. He hated languages, couldn't get his head around them. There was no way, no way he would live with her in Paris. No way he could be happy if he did. She could try and help him and have some fun, take him to films with her, with subtitles in English, but he'd never appreciate it. He'd pretend not to care, but he'd be resentful of her. He'd be so busy pretending that he wouldn't, couldn't for a moment enjoy Paris the way she would. He could never live there. He could never really live there. A moment ago, Nena hadn't fully realized she was going anywhere at all. Now, she seems to be hurtling away from everyone and everything she knew. And I'll leave it there for now. Beautiful, thank you so much. And uh, I want to kind of obviously kind of ask you some questions and, and have a chat about the book in a second. But I guess, first of all, for people that, you know, haven't yet read it, who are going to pick up the paper back after this, do you just want to kind of give us a brief outline of, of what happens in the novel? Yeah, so the novel is a comedy about Nena, who is 16 years old, um, and her single mum, Joni. Nena lives in Manchester with Joni, and they have a really tender warm relationship full of humor and and love at first but because nana's never met her nigerian father morris she has lots of questions about him which her mother refuses to discuss and when a, when nana starts to dig into her Igbo nigerian heritage and starts to learn the language and starts asking questions about her father her mother she and her mother have um there's a kind of a wedge driven between them so the novel is really about their uh, journeys of self-discovery it's about their journeys of discovery about each other um, and it's also about their friends and lovers and who are also on sort of journeys of their own really there is I think in this novel one of the things I really adore about it is there's this huge cast of characters isn't there there's a lot of you know we get we get Nena obviously kind of from the title but there's there's kind of Jonathan and his tribulations as the parents or the kind of cast of characters that as you say kind of orbit around Nena and I just wonder kind of how that was to write, I guess, to kind of hold different people's lives and, and, and how as a writer you, you kind of managed to juggle all that so successfully. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed that aspect of writing the novel. It was um, a real challenge, but I really enjoyed it. And it sort of came out of just the story I found myself telling. There were some elements of the story that I really knew straight away that I wanted to tell. And there were some elements that I found that I wanted to tell, if that makes sense. So as I was writing the story, it became one of family and chosen family and of communication and breakdowns in communication. And I just found myself realizing that this is a story not just about two people, but about the people who make them who they are and the people who they in turn impact and the people who they in turn have an influence on either for better or worse. Um, and I found that therefore it couldn't just be about a mother and a daughter. It couldn't just be about a parent and child because it never really is, I suppose. It was about, it became about sexuality and religion and it became about a black gay man who was struggling with his self-esteem and it became about um, Nana's friends who were also kind of lost in their own way. Um, so those characters kind of grew out of the story that I found myself telling. Um, if anything, I had to kind of pare it back and sort of hold myself back from having even more characters. Um, so that was a bit of a journey for me as well. I think it's really interesting that, you know, as a poet, I keep thinking I want to write a novel or I keep trying and I keep failing because I just can't hold that I can't hold that kind of largeness in my head or that kind of the world of that in my head I think is such a specific skill to novelists mm -hmm. and I just think there'll be kind of hopeful writers or aspiring writers watching this live or kind of watching it later on the Instagram and I just wonder you know, it's interesting you talk about that process of parts of the story that you knew and then there are parts of this story 
that reveal themselves to you as you write them. And one of the structural devices are these kind of biblical um, quotes or phrases that kind of begin every chapter um, and kind of act as almost kind of um, epigraphs, I guess, or kind of headers. And I just wonder kind of on a, on a structural level or on a, on, a, on a level of craft, how it is that you go about kind of holding that world in your head? Is it kind of um, kind of post-it notes stuck to a wall in a kind of beautiful mind kind of way and kind of notes everywhere? Is it a spreadsheet? Is it just that the novel unfolds itself naturally kind of how is it just on a technical level that you're kind of holding all that together yeah that's a really good question um to be honest most of the novel just came out of trial and error um i i have never had any sort of formal education in writing so it's i've only ever just sort of read a lot and and sort of thought a lot and made a lot of mistakes um so with the novel in terms of the structure of it um i sort of just clung to anything that any sort of um, techniques and tools that would help the first um a lot of the novel came about just by um layers that i realized i wanted to add after each draft i wrote something like seven or eight drafts of this before my editor even saw the book so i found myself just writing drafts and then looking at them and thinking i need to find a way to tame this and to to map it out um, so I found actually found spreadsheets really helpful. It meant I could sort of map each chapter and what's going on with each character really clearly and visibly for me, that really helps me. Um, so it meant that I could see where each character was up to and what was maybe missing or where I wanted to um, take a character if I hadn't taken them there before and what sort of um, conclusions everything had to come to. Um, and I found that really helpful. Um, at the moment with the second book I'm writing, I'm also finding it helpful to use things like a whiteboard. Um, that is really great. It means that I can, again, it's quite a nice to have a visual representation of something. Um, I think having a, writing a novel, like you say, it's a very long, potentially unwieldy piece of work. So anything that you can have to sort of help you see it all at once is really helpful. Um, I'm aware of some writers who um, print out every page and sort of literally look at them one by one. And that sounds fantastic. I'm not sure I've got the printing budget for that quite yet. Um, <laughs> but I think that sounds like a really useful thing to do. But for me, it's all about sort of anything that visually helps me see where yeah. the novel is going. Fantastic. And I want to chat a bit, I think, about about Manchester. Because, you know, me and you have known each other for a long time. We both kind of, or certainly I feel like I came of age in Manchester, like our early 20s, we spent a lot of time um, kind of going out and having fun and making mistakes and blah, blah, blah. And one of the really interesting things, I think, about this novel, and one of the things that's really centred on this gorgeous paperback edition is the city itself. Like, this is the Manchester skyline itself that's kind of printed on this novel. And it's still a rare thing, I think, to find novels set in, in, in these kind of northern cities. It's not set in London primarily. You know, it's not, it, we visit Cambridge every so often, but a predominant amount of the action of this novel happens um, in Manchester. And I just wonder kind of whether that was a conscious decision or whether that was just because this is where it's based or whether, you know, th there was a real desire to kind of root Nena within this city, do you think? Yeah, that's a really, again, I love that question. Um, all, all really good questions. I keep saying it, it's true. But um, yeah, I mean, it was partly a practical decision because Manchester and Cambridge are the cities that I know the best. Um, I was born in Manchester. I still live here. I grew up here. Um, this is where my life is. Um, but also Cambridge is where I studied. So I have a knowledge of that. And I felt that I could write these two places convincingly. Um, but at the same time, I think I was really, there was, I took a real joy in sort of writing a novel, especially a novel about black people in part that was not set in London. It was really great for me to be able to give that kind of representation and to tell my story. Um, and really, I, I, in a lot of ways, I think it had to be set in Manchester. You know, there are some things that are common to lots of big cities. Um, but for me, I think Manchester's, the way Manchester's diversity works, both ethnically and also socioeconomically, um, I felt that those are really key parts of the story in lots of places. And I really wanted to, I don't, I'm not sure that I could have told those stories in, different, in a different city. I'm not mm. sure I could have done that. Um, and for me, there's also a really big contrast between the two cities as well. Manchester and Cambridge are very, very different in terms of um, just the, the, the diversity that you see. Um, you know, Nena's friendship group is much more diverse 
um, than her mother's friendship group was at university, and that's no accident. That's really, I think it's just so great. Like, I just, I'm obsessed by that cover. And I think the, the, the cover for the hardback, which I was trying to find, but I think my boyfriend's nicked it, is also really <laughs> beautiful. Kind of the full, that was a kind of full image of, of the kind of, um, of Nena, wasn't it? Of a kind of um, an interpretation of, of what Nena might look like. And here we uh, slowly kind of approaching Manchester in this really interesting way, or kind of approaching adulthood somehow, isn't it? Kind of approaching the, um, somehow, the, yeah, the, the, that kind of, the city or the kind of adulthood of something in a really interesting way, I think. How hard, the, the thing, what we got, I think, from the extract that you read at the start, and kind of how you've talked about it as well, is it's an incredibly moving novel, but it is also really funny. It's incredibly funny, and, and not in, you know, there are some kind of um, set pieces that I don't want to give away, but for instance, like the sex scene that happens um, in the food kind of parlour or the pantry or the kitchen. Um, yeah. But there's kind of beautiful humour that's kind of threaded in the language of it, I think, in the kind of, in just in the voice, in the voice of the of your voice throughout that novel. And I just wonder how hard it is to write comedy. I think it's an incredibly difficult thing and very few people can do it well and you do it astonishingly in this novel. And just whether, like how, you know, is each kind of sentence, I guess, you know, that extract that you read at the start, each sentence is so beautifully composed and just kind of has this beautiful cadence to it and this humour and this lightness of touch. But like you said, there were seven drafts of this before the editor saw it. And, and I just wonder like how much, you know, comedy sometimes when it's done very well, like this feels effortless, but how much work does it take to find the humour or find the humour for these different characters as well? Because they're going through some real stuff. They're going through some difficult things. They're on real journeys. How much, how much did you have to push to kind of find the lightness and the humanity, I guess, in what was happening? Yeah, I mean, com you're right. Comedy is um, a tremendously difficult thing to pull off. Um, and a lot of my work in the first and the early draft of the novel was figuring out how to make something funny in writing. You know, obviously a novel is not like, say, theatre or television where... Um, you know, you've got an audience who, you know, hopefully, if especially if they're live in front of you, will be reacting in real time. You can't gauge that and move with them. You have to sort of plan it out, I suppose, in some ways a bit more carefully and just let go of that expectation that you're going to have any kind of live real time feedback. And so, excuse me, a lot of the early drafts was me just figuring that out and coming to terms with that. Um, and the thing about comedy really is that I, for me, it's, uh, it's both a very difficult and unforgiving medium, but it's also a very good guide. So, you know, it's hard to laugh if it's hard to find something funny if there's lots of other stuff going wrong with the writing. You know, comedy, I think, demands a lot of other stuff go right at the same time. Um, it demands a kind of equilibrium of other things. So, you know, if the tone, if the tone feels um, unkind or if there feels something kind of sneering about the comedy, then it's hard to laugh. Um, if you don't know enough about the characters as, as well, if, the, if, if something sort of doesn't make sense, it's quite hard again to pull off a joke. So, so as much as I found comedy um, a difficult medium in which to write, it was also very helpful for me because if I could feel if a joke wasn't right for me if I could feel it wasn't right I could it sort of forced me to think about anything else that was not working sometimes jokes just aren't funny but sometimes it, they're a measure of what else is going on in the writing that's so interesting so it's almost like the the joke or the kind of comedy of it is the canary in the coal mine or is the thing that can send oh that's not quite working but it vibrates off so you say oh it's because that sentence isn't quite constructed right or because we don't know enough about that characters why they'd say that. that's so interesting so the comedy is the barometer for for almost testing how that draft is kind of working in the moment absolutely absolutely it's sort of yeah, um, and obviously there are lots of different types of comedy like you say i'm balancing comedy with some really heavy stuff here you know um again for those who haven't read the novel it's there are themes of real um mental health problems and um, there's a character who loses his religion and you know there's separation and isolation and loneliness and real problems in this novel that the characters are going through um, but again I found that one of the things that comedy could be quite helpful to was to actually 
balance those things and to ease the reader into those things. Um, I, fee I, I, I feel like as British people, especially we have quite um, a skittish sensibility when it comes to talking about some of the heavier things in life and to, especially when it comes to talking directly about emotions. If we think about sort of writers in the canon who do that, um, in the canon, who do that, you know, there are very few who do that so very brazenly and openly. Um, you know, we've got like Ian Forster and we've got um, Somerset Moore, but really um, a lot of the time we like to sort of approach emotion by the back door. Um, otherwise we kind of tend to pull away and, and get put off. And I found the comedy a really good way to sort of ease into that emotion without hopefully without um without undermining it i think it's interesting like you know people like ian foster somerset mom i know you're obsessed by middle march i wonder what um what kind of books or what authors were over your shoulder you, or you felt were on your shoulders you wrote this um or kind of who you felt with the presiding spirits of the book maybe if that's a different way of saying it yeah i really um i owe a lot to white teeth by zadie smith um it was it's a novel set in london um about a whole host of characters um from different backgrounds and different experiences um and even though it's set in a different city from where i grew up and where i live when i was reading it when i was about 20 years old um, I was just struck by how familiar everything felt. Um, it was this novel which, you know, is set in a community that I recognise and that I kind of grew up in, like the primary school that Irie and Majid and Milat go to, that was the primary school that I went to. I, I understand, not physically, but I understand it. I, I recognise the culture and the, the environment and, and even the use of language that the kids use. And, um, and I thought, I want to try and do that for my world. I want to try and do that, represent that kind of really diverse, um, vibrant culture and life for the world that I know. Um, and also its use of humour was just fantastic. I'd never seen it before, like that very, again, very British style of humour, that kind of Nick Hornby um, descended style of humour um, used before um, to talk about that world. And it was a kind of a claiming of something that I'd never seen claimed before. And that was definitely in my mind when I was writing this book. Um, but also things like Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie's um, Purple Hibiscus and, the, and of course, Half Half of Yellow Sun. These books were just so brave. And so um, they were so unique to me at the time in terms of their representation of Igbo Nigerian culture. I'd never seen that in that way before. I was still a, f a year or two off from finally getting around to reading Things Fall Apart. So for me, that was like a huge revelation at the time. Amazing. And um, just, I guess, you know, again, I mean, you know, we've known each other for a long time, far too long. And, uh, and we've lived with each other's kind of early ambitions of wanting to be a writer I think for a long time and kind of and I lived with you know your desire to write this and kind of saw early iterations of it and the kind of joy when it came out last year when it kind of arrived in hardback and we had this lovely party in Manchester when such things were still allowed <laughs> and I just you know as this year felt we've had all these kind of prize shortlistings and wins that I wheeled off I know there's been some tv work that's come off the back of that there's been radio stuff it's been this incredible year um, and I just wonder if you've had chance to, you know, take stock of that, kind of how has that felt? And, and yeah, just kind of reflections on just this year that, that's now marked by the paperback coming out. Yeah, absolutely. It's been such a journey. I remember those conversations that we used to have as well about sort of our ambitions for what we wanted to do with our writing and what purpose is we, we felt we wanted to give to it. And it's been such a journey, I, you know, a, about a year ago now, when the hardback came out, as you say, I was much more of a novice. That It's only been a year, but I feel like I've been on this, I feel like I've really grown into a, almost a different person in some ways. Um, you know, I went from thinking of my novel as, you know, a Word document that somebody else has done the f fantastic work in, of turning into this hardback to now I'm, this is how I see the, this is how I see my work. I see it as, I see it as a novel. I see it as... Um, as a, a book that you know I'm, I'm used to talking about it and to hearing people's reactions to it and the reviews and the prizes and the shortlistings have been such a wonderful encouragement to me 
um, in sort of birthing this new, this whole new sort of life that I that I'm living now. It's it's completely different from um, my life before. I'm uh, you know writing takes up a huge part of my time now in ways that it just couldn't have done before. I don't I don't I don't have to only sort of write during half term and in the evenings when I go home. I I teach part time now. You know, there's I've made real adjustments in my life um, in really practical ways to make more room for writing, which has been such a huge blessing. And yeah, just to be able to have this privilege of talking to people about my work and and hearing back from them has been just such a huge gift that's come over the year, over the past year or so. That's so nice to hear. It really is, and I think. I guess like, cause, so one way of framing this question, because I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, again, people that are watching this or are going to be watching it later on who are aspiring, who are wanting to, you know, kind of have their hardback out, their paperback out and kind of live in that world. But one way I thought we might think about it is if you could go back in time, sort of three or four years and walk into that bar and see me and you sat there in a corner kind of worrying about, you know, our writing or kind of what that world might look like. And you could kind of walk up to that table. What sort of advice do you think you would have for for kind of for me and you when we were kind of anxious about just what it meant to be a writer or any kind of advice that you could have given our younger selves as, as we kind of sat in that bar? What do you think there's anything you would say? Hmm. Apart from don't just... That's the wine, Andrew. That would be <laughs> yeah. um, Oh, those days. Um, if I had to give advice to a younger, younger me, or younger us, do you think, or younger, or just younger me? Yeah, well, either. Yeah, but younger you, because it's about you. Um, I guess I would say try and enjoy the process a little bit more, which is hard at that stage. You know, before you get a contract and before you are before you have, um, you know, any guarantee that anybody's ever going to read what you've written. Um, it's quite hard to think of it in any joyful terms a lot of the time because you are working, um, certainly in my case, alongside a full-time job, a demanding one as well. And there's a lot of uncertainty that can be quite demoralising. But um, I would say, you know, try and enjoy it more. You know, you're writing this comedy, you're writing about yes heavy things but also you're writing about redemption and reconciliation and um try and enjoy that process of bringing to life the story that you've got in your head um and let it bore you up i think i think one of the interesting things about this book for me is that it really has buoyed me up during difficult times in my life it was even before i knew that it was going to ever see the light of day it was a real boon to me that I had a project that I was really passionate about and a, a story that I had to tell um, I remember us talking about this like I remember this is one of the things that we sort of we became friends over at first is this, this like really strong passion for writing and this idea that we couldn't not do the writing that we that we both had in our heads and that, that we were doing at the time it was um, one of the things that I think we first bonded over and I would say I guess to my younger self just try and enjoy that sort of passion a bit more because it's going to happen I think that's such good advice, that enjoyment of it. And in a second, I think I'm going to turn the comment if you've got any questions that they ask as well, um, if that's all right. Yeah. And I, but I was just, because you kind of teased us earlier by using the phrase, the next book, I just wondered if you can sort of say anything about that project or there's anything you want to say about that, um, or if it, re it remains entirely a mystery for now. Uh, yeah, I'm very happy to talk at least a bit about it. Um, my next novel is coming out in spring 2022 with Dialogue Books, so a couple of years away, which is really nice to have that space. Charmaine is a wonderful, wonderful editor who's just very smart, but also very humane. Um, so my next novel is uh, not a sequel of The Private Joys of Nana Maloney, but it's got some themes, some in common. It's uh, It was based on or inspired by the Book of Ruth in the Bible. Um, I don't know if anybody's familiar with that, but if they're not, it's the story of a woman who migrates and marries into a Jewish family, and um, she's very briefly married before um, disaster strikes, and all the men in her family die. Her husband, her brother-in-law, her father-in-law, and her sister-in-law gets, you know, the tradition is that she goes home, back to her family, 
But um, her mother-in-law, Naomi, says to Ruth, you need to do the same thing as well. It's time for you to go. And Ruth, there's a very powerful moment in the, in the, in the Bible, in this text, where she says, no, I don't want to do that. I want to stay with you. And where you go, I will go. Where you, uh, your God will be my God. And I really wanted to tell that story of interdependence um, in Britain today between Nigerian and British men. And I wanted to sort of investigate the spaces between what is said in the Bible, the biblical book of Ruth, it's, it's very short. It's one of the shortest books in the Bible. So there's a lot that we just never get told. Um, and I really wanted to investigate what happens, you, you know, what, how did the family come to be that way? And um, what, are their, what exactly are the dynamics between them and what are their backstories and how does it come to be that somebody would totally ignore tradition and not go back to their family where they've grown up and stay in this strange new place with somebody that they don't know that well and choose to support each other and help each other through life and help each other survive. Um, and it's been a wonderful journey so far. I've got a draft that I'm editing now um, and it's really exciting. I can't wait for it to come out. Um, I'm not gonna reveal the title just yet, just in case I change my mind, but I'm really excited about it. Fantastic, go, I, yeah, go finish it now, go. That's... <laughs> yeah. Bye <It's> everyone. <laughs> longer we've got some questions um from people so throwing questions if you've got them somebody saying they're already buying the book which is fantastic oh, thank um, you. a really difficult one here that or maybe it's not difficult uh, am floria is asking are writers born or made Ooh, that's a really good question Isn't i it? guess i can only speak for myself in my experience but i think writers are probably made rather than born, um, especially as a teacher, I, I'm, which is my sort of day job. Um, I, I don't really believe so much in talent. I would never like encourage a child by saying you're very talented. I would, I would congratulate them on working hard and I would encourage them to work hard, but I'd never say, oh, you're very talented. I don't really believe in that. I believe that I believe in hard work and circumstances. Um, and I think that for me, it's been a matter of those two things as well. You know, I think that I've definitely worked hard at it, but I've also been fortunate enough to have had a great education. And I'm really fortunate enough to have had like books in the house when I was growing up and stuff like that. So um, for me, it came very, it felt like it came very naturally at first. And there's definitely been times when I've struggled with it, but it definitely felt, it definitely felt natural at first. And that made it easier for me to go with. Um, from a really young age, you know, as soon as I literally started to learn how to write. But then there are fantastic writers who don't write anything until they're 40 or 50 or 60 and and they've produced beautiful things. I think writers are made. Fantastic. That's a really good answer. I've answered that. I'm excited to hear about talent as well because that makes me feel this hope for me yet. Um, <laughs> Micarelli is asking, what is your favourite book in the world? Oh, that's a really... That's a really tough question. And I think my answer would change from day to day. But I think at the moment it would be The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy, which is an incredible novel from just over 20 years ago, I think, um, which um, is the story of um, um, a middle-class woman in India falling in love with an, an untouchable man. So love across the caste divide. Um, and it is just beautiful and funny and terribly sad and really knowing and just wonderful in so many different ways so fantastic that's a good that is a very good book actually mm -hmm. and i aspire to that level of fame where one could just publish a book every 20 years i know i mean yeah. that's yeah i mean I'm, I'm bragging about my like two and a half years of sort of gap between books but my word imagine just like popping up every 20 years and delivering a fantastic <laughs> novel and then going home again um obviously she's done non-fiction in that time as well but yeah that's that's amazing that's the dream there's a lot of love in the um comment section for this new truth and for this new book so that's exciting you've already seen mm. well, as yet to be published um second book which is always you know, and I guess I mean one thing that I about with this list is in the idea for that second book, and then the idea for Nena, and I guess an idea for as yet unthought of third book. Do you sort of carry all those ideas around with you at once? It's not a case that suddenly you know you finish the first book and then you sit and go right, 
I'll wait for the next idea. I guess, is it almost like juggling that there are all these different ideas happening at once? Yeah, I think it is like juggling for me. Um, I remember in, it started really in my, in not long after I graduated from university, I had this um, very boring admin job just to kind of pay the bills um, that was literally just filing and photocopying all day. And it was fine, but it was not a demanding job, which and the upside of that was that I had a lot of brain space to think about plot and character and ideas. And um, even though I, a lot of those ideas haven't necessarily made it into what is now the finished product of the novel, um, it sort of gave me, I got into that habit of being able to juggle ideas. Um, but at the same time, I'm not somebody who can do more than one big fiction project at a time. I like yeah. to just, you know, do I want to write this novel and then move on to the third one, even though I've got a couple of ideas about the next novel I want to write and I've got ideas about a play I want to write and, you know, I've got so many things that I want to, want to get to. I know that I want to finish one thing at a time so that I can do it as well as I can and then move on. Otherwise, the grass is always greener. I think as a writer, you're always very aware of how imperfect your ideas are and how imperfect your work is. Um, yeah. and and it's very easy to kind of think, oh, well, the next one will be better. I'll just put, I'll just do the next one. I don't know, maybe it's different for poetry because what you're writing is perhaps shorter. But um, for, for me, certainly the, these kind of longer works of fiction, I am I really want to finish this one big thing and then move on. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's fair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. That's good. Um, if people have questions again, just stick them in the box. I've just got plenty of questions you keep asking. Um, and asking one of the things that we've not actually talked about yet about Nena about the private joys of Nena Maloney is the is the kind of timeline of it because one of the really clever things it does I think is kind of shift us back and forth so for Manchester kind of contemporary Manchester we, we're back in Cambridge um, I don't want to do plot spoilers but we kind of end up back in Cambridge and kind of examining kind of really well um, and I just wonder kind of did that was that timeline or that kind of that notion of how deftly you can sort of weave those different editions together, did that come almost straight away or was there, was there ever a, um, was there ever a draft of it where we kind of went chronologically through it? Or did you always want that kind of, that kind of figure of eight weaving in of those, which I think is so successful in this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I don't remember a, a, a draft where, everything which happens in the novel now happened chronologically. I didn't, I don't think I ever did that. I think I maybe had an earlier draft of the novel in which less of um, the time, there's less sort of jumping between timelines. Um, but as I wrote on and on, I realized that I, that again, the story that I'm telling, the story of Nena, this teenager and her mother, is never just their story. So that's why I wanted to bounce back and forth between Nena's story and her parents. <clears throat> so when I do sort of flip back to the past in the 90s in Cambridge, it's because I'm exploring the relationship between Nena's parents and how they got together and what made them fall in love and also what made them break up and what, what horrible thing has happened or what dark or difficult thing has happened that separates the two of them and that means that Joni can't even explain it now. I, I really found that a really helpful thing for me as well to be able to get a sense of the characters. Um, there's some stuff that just didn't make it into the draft, into the final um, version of the novel because it was really a way for me to just do sketches and figure out their relationship. I was figuring out, really as I went along with the early drafts, what was going on between Nana's parents and that sort of bouncing between timelines um, was difficult, <laughs> but was also really, really helpful for me. Fantastic. And I got, when I said that I was um, going to be hosting you on this Instagram chat, I got a question um, sent to my kind of Instagram as well, which was specifically about um, the character of Jonathan and just where the inspiration for him had come from. Um, and I think the question was kind of asking whether there'd be any... Um, trying to remember the question now because I can't actually this, but really a question about where the inspiration for Jonathan came, whether it was kind of based on kind of people that you'd known or kind of experiences that had been related, whether he was just a kind of, um, whether he was just a kind of invention of the writer's imagination. Yeah, mm, good question. Jonathan is, so again, if you haven't read the novel, Jonathan is 
um, a black gay man in his sort of late 30s, um, the same age as Joni's, as Joni, Nana's mother. Um, and he started, he starts off in the novel being an evangelical Christian with a very fervent belief in God and being, and, you know, very um, anti-gay, very homophobic, and then realises, of course, that he himself is gay and that's something that he's going to have to struggle with for his entire life. And he goes through some real dark times and then he ends up um, dating this, well, dating is maybe a loose word for what they do, but Jonathan ends up seeing this terrible man called Silas who treats him really badly. Um, and part of that was, you know, based on, you know, with most of the novel, with much of the novel, it's based on stuff that I've seen and experienced. So I've definitely had my fair share of poor experiences. Um, but I've thankfully, the Jonathan's story is not my own. Um, there are things about Jonathan's life which I can definitely relate to and which are inspired by experiences that I've had. So when I was about Nena's age rather than Jonathan's, I also lost a very profound faith in God. I was never in, of that evangelical homophobic tradition. That wasn't the church. Those weren't the churches that I went to as a child. Um, but it was a big part of my life, as I think is probably true for a lot of Nigerians, um, even in diaspora, or maybe especially in diaspora. Um, we have this very strong tradition of church going and Bible study and all of the rest of it. And breaking away from that was something that I felt I'm, I, I had to do in terms of my beliefs. I, they just changed without my volition. But at the same time, it was, it left me kind of lost in a way. And I had to sort of really figure out a new way of seeing the world. And that profound sense of being lost is something that I think all the characters experience in their own different ways. Certainly Nena, um, who's very young and doesn't have the vocabulary to, exp to sort of find her way in that an older character might do. Um, but for Jonathan, who is figuring out really basic questions of self-esteem and self-worth, um, and who's been challenged on those things by the by the church? Um, it's for him. It's it was a re it was a really important. There's a really important journey for Jonathan, which I won't spoil. Um, but there's a really important journey for Jonathan in terms of finding his way back to a way to see himself as redeemable or or worthy. Fantastic. And just before we hear um, another extract from the, um, there's just a really interesting question I think from Walton here. You said, why do you think that religion and the Bible feature so much modern queer literature? And so he's mm -hmm. seen, or Paul Mendez's um, book as well. And, you know, whether we, you know, whether that is um, a kind of, obviously, if you've got any thoughts about, about that connection between religion and kind of modern and certainly maybe queer literature. As well. Yeah, that's a really good question because it's true. You know, like you say, Paul Mendez, um, absolutely um, explores it in his book Rainbow Milk. Um, he uh, and of course you have things like Angels in America, which in a very different way explores that kind of tension as well. And I think tension is the right word. Um, I think certainly for me, um, religion is it's in the in the novel. I think religion is a way to find oneself, and it's also something which one has to find oneself outside of. It's kind of there's a tension. Uh, there's, uh, you know, I think it's not uncommon for Christ the Christian tradition to tell gay people that we're unworthy and that we are and we shouldn't exist and that there's something wrong with us. Um, but at the same time, it offers this really powerful language of that that I think is common to a lot of human experience, which is that journey from sort of sin to redemption, from unworthiness to worthiness, over which we only have a partial amount of control. And I think, as much as I disagree with a lot of the messages that the church sends that message I think is really very closely linked to human life and human experiences. So it's hard, I think, for, I think a lot of writers who are familiar with those traditions, who've grown up in those traditions to sort of break away from that because religion is so powerful. It is more than beliefs. It really is um, and a way of seeing the world. Um, and we, and as writers, our job is to play with things and to, to criticize things and to break away from things. Um, but and with something that big, I think it's perhaps um, inevitable that we have that kind of tense relationship with it. Fantastic. Well, that seems like a perfect place just to ask you to um, read us another extract from The Private Boys of Nena Maloney to send people running to Waterstone's books in the the website to order their own copy. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being such a fantastic host, Andrew. Um, and yeah, I'm going to read from um, The Private Joys of Nana Maloney. I'm going to read from chapter five, 
um, in one of the sort of flashback scenes that we um, spoke about earlier. Um, Joni and um, Nella's father, who's called Morris, they've met at university in Cambridge in the, 19, in the early 1990s and they are, they're falling in love, but it's, as we'll see through the novel, it's not perfect or easy by any means. Joni is white, Morris is black, and they, Morris is Christian and Joni is not. Um, and there's a complexity to their relationship that I explore. Chapter five, though I call and cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. Lamentations chapter three, verse eight. 1992, kissing Morris was not like kissing any of the other boys Joni had met. It wasn't just that the others were absolutely terrible kissers and Morris wasn't, although that was true. Cliff pecked at her with small, quick, darting kisses, like a pigeon picking at breadcrumbs. Her lips were sore afterwards. Smelly Roderick had actually transferred plaque from his mouth to hers. Morris, on the other hand, kissed her as though he were kissing another person who wanted to be kissed and who was kissing him back. His kisses were long and slow and generous. But it was more than that. She had never experienced a desire like this, even as a teenager. It was like nothing she'd ever wanted before. Even when she wasn't kissing him, she thought about it all the time. But somehow she could never reproduce the actual experience of it in her mind in any detail. It was as though something in her refused to contemplate an experience so pure in the abstract, as though she could not allow herself to enjoy it in any diminished way, because that might cheapen the real thing. At their most specific, her fantasies of Morris revolved around what she knew about him, what she could remember from that afternoon after they had left the cafe to find another less crowded one, his kindness, the smile that never seemed to leave his face, his eyes that seemed so dark that when she looked closely enough were a soft brown, his soft hands that seemed strong, and his large shoulders, the smell of soap on his skin. And yet at first she had almost regretted agreeing to go on a date with him at all. Once she got home and the smell of and the spell of him even wore off, she worried that he was too serious, too severe. He was a Christian, a Christian, and the worst kind, and evangelical. Were those men in the cafe really his friends? Would they have to be her friends? Would they ever be able to relax around one another if he knew that she could never be a Christian? Her Cambridge friends buzzed with polite middle-class excitement at the idea of her going on a date with a man whose skin was brown. They weighed up the idea of making jokes about Joni being unable to get back on her bicycle after a date with a black man and prudently decided it was better to drop more general hints about the protuberance of a phallus into her otherwise unphallic life. Ophelia left cucumbers in her cupboards. Cressida threw phallic vegetables at her door in the early evenings and ran away giggling. But when she got to the restaurant on King's Parade that night, when she was with him, she realised suddenly why people so carefully avoid those they know they might regret falling in love with, those whose faith or family prohibited a lover of the same gender or different faith. Mm. It was because there's no stopping it once it starts. Right or wrong, practical or wholly impossible, she did not, and would not, care. <clears throat> they ate their meal as though under some strange kind of hypnosis, all talk one moment, silent in wonder the next. He offered to pay for the meal, but she, forcing herself to forget her yawning overdraft, refused. He took her for ice cream afterwards, and then they sat on the wall outside King's College and they talked and they kissed. Kissing him, because it was real, was even better than she had imagined. You're a very nice man, she said, because it was all that she could think of to say afterwards, and she wanted to break the silence that had started as intimate and was growing into something she could not name. But he only laughed and said, are you surprised? Well, when I met your friends, yes, they're odd, but they're good people, I think, said Morris. Jonathan's confused, but most people are. You think? said Joni. Yes. Sometimes we know about it at the time, and sometimes we don't realise until much later. Jonathan doesn't know. Have you ever been confused? said Joni. He laughed his large laugh again. Not like that, no. But about other things? Absolutely. Like what? said Joni. Living here in England. I still am, sometimes. Why? You seem to be doing pretty well for yourself, Morris. He laughed again, but this time it was quiet and almost rueful. I seem like a lot of things, I think. You know, Morris isn't even my name. 
Johnny stared at him. But everyone calls you Morris. It's what you told me to call you. I know, but it's not my name. Not my first name, anyway. It's my middle name. When I moved to England, I decided to, keep, I decided to use my English name. I think I thought it would help me fit in better. And did it? Yeah. Morris shook his head. The opposite. Most of the time, it only makes people stare at me even more as though I have no right to an English name, as though I must have stolen it from someone. As though somewhere in Cambridge, there's a confused old white man walking around, wondering why he's called Chinedu now. Yeah. Chinedu, said Joni, as though trying it out on him. He smiled at her wryly. You can't ask, you know. What does it mean? What does your name mean? I asked you first, said Joni, and I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that before, and I never asked myself. I suppose I always assumed I was named after Joan of Arc, but saying it aloud, it seems silly. Why silly? Because I'm nothing like her. I think my mum wants me to be like her, though. You're not all that different, said Morris. I'd say you're pretty determined. I heard what happened with your uni supervisor, you know. I'm impressed you're still here. Well, thank you, said Joni. She smiled. But to be honest, most of the time I feel like I'm hanging on by my fingertips here. And my mum, she doesn't only want me to be brave, she wants me to be the bravest. Not just clever, but the cleverest. And what do you want? Joni let her legs swing back and forth. She shook her head and shrugged. If I ever figure it out, I'll let you know. I want to know what your name means, though. I did ask first. Ah, you've got me. Chinadu means God leads. Although where God is leading me, I do not know. Joni was silent for a moment before she asked, do you think that Jonathan will be okay? I do. I had a friend like him once who was confused like him, or rather afraid. What happened to him? He struggled for some years while we were growing up. Nowadays, he's happy though. He's living the Nigerian dream, in fact. And what's the Nigerian dream, Joni asked. He's a medical doctor, said Morris, married to a woman. And is he happy? I haven't seen him in a long time. I pray he is, but I don't think that's what Jonathan, I don't think that's Jonathan's dream. I think Jonathan wants Alistair. Yes. Or I think perhaps Jonathan wants a kind of peace, and I think he thinks he'll only find it with Alistair. And do you think they'll get together? Joni asked. Morris sighed. They're already as together as they'll ever be. And how together is that? Well, Jonathan is in love, and he believes Alistair is. Alistair, however, is very much in love with someone else who loves him back. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh? Yes, Alistair doesn't help things, I'm afraid. He's one of those people who wants everyone to love him, so he'll never tell Jonathan he's not got a chance. And the sad thing is, I think Jonathan probably knows this already, but he doesn't want to admit it to himself. Joni looked at Morris for a long moment. He was looking out onto the street where people walked slowly past King's College as the sun set on the very beautiful little town. Is Jonathan a very close friend? Hmm? Mm, no, not really. He seemed to know a lot about him. How he's feeling? I suppose I understand some things about him, in a way. I thought... Morris paused for a moment as though sharing something so intimate could not be done fluently, but reverently and with hesitation. I used to think that coming to study here, to Cambridge, would give me something I wanted. Knowledge, maybe, or certainty about the world. About God? Morris nodded slowly. She could tell from his face that he was unsure how, he, how she knew to ask that. I think I used to think that somehow, if I left my home and came somewhere so different, I might find him here, then I might find him in the difference. Do you think he's real? Mm. Morris laughed, a slightly bitter laugh. You make him sound like an imaginary friend. You make him sound silly, like I made him up as a child. Isn't that what you're afraid of? said Jenny. Morris looked at her sharply, then nodded and looked away. If someone were to ask her to identify a particular part of Morris's character, a specific thing that she had fallen in love with, she would have been unable to do so. It was his large ears that she loved every bit as much as his big laugh, his mm -hmm. gait just as much as his heart. It occurred to her that if for some reason she had to give up any part of him, she would be unable to surrender even the smallest thing. She knew then that loves like theirs were formed in just as complicated a manner as they were torn suddenly apart.
That's so beautiful. Final sentence. She um, that loves like that formed in just as complicated a manner as born suddenly apart. It's such beautiful writing, and it's been a joy to hear it out loud. Um, that about the book and to, for people to find out a bit more about it. And so the private joys of Nena Maloney, hold up your copy as well. Private joys of Nena Maloney by Okitrip and Zaylin, available in paperback. Um, it's in all good waterstones. Um, you've also put the link to what to the book on your Instagram bio. That's right, isn't it? Um, just yeah. tell us what your Instagram handle is so people can find that. Yeah, so my Instagram handle is Nzelu Wright. So it's uh, my surname, which is Nzelu, which you can see on the cover here, N Z E L U, and just then just the word Wrights, W R I T E S, Nzelu Wrights, which is actually I think in the top of the screen now, just under Waterstones, if you um, if you want to just click on there. So, yeah, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Andrew. You've been a fantastic host. No worries. Thank you very much, everyone, for listening. And buy a copy of this book by give them to all your friends and your enemies. Spend some time during lockdown part two with it. Okay. And take care, be safe, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank Good night. You. See you soon, everyone. Good night.